Hello and welcome to Athletic Director U. My name is Zach Dayton. I'm the Senior Associate Athletics Director at Fairfield University overseeing marketing and communications. I'm here today with Dr. Derek Gregg, Vice President and Director of Athletics at Tulsa, and Tom McClellan, Director of Athletics at Louisiana Tech. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Zach. Absolutely. Today we're gonna to talk about uh, coaches' meetings, uh, individual meetings, and how they're structured, and how you kind of coach your coach through uh, a number of different scenarios. So, Tommy, let me start with you. Uh, we're talking structure, we're talking uh, what's the meeting cadence with your head coaches, the frequency, location. Uh, do you set the individual uh, head coach meeting, or do you let that the head coach's flexibility of their schedule kind of dictate when you meet? Yeah, so we kind of have a layered approach to it. So you have um, in terms of how our head coaches uh, are, um, you know, engaged with, we have obviously departmental meetings, which they're a part of. It's just more of a broader corporate communication. And then we have the head coach specific meeting, which is all the head coaches in one room and then uh, the senior staff for the athletics department. And that one gets a little bit more into the weeds and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really specifically talking about, you know, uh, the items of uh, national narratives or uh, items on our campus. Um, and w with that group, we, there's an agenda that our, my secretary sends out and coaches can respond to that and say, hey, I want to talk about this. And not that, uh, that something doesn't get brought up that's not on the agenda, but it's certainly a guiding path as we go through, hey, this is an issue. We've got a housing issue on campus or mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what about, you know, cost of attendance or wh whatever the national issue is. And so that, that's really, um, that's kind of a, um, a heavy lifting meeting uh, for the head coaches. And then one of the other things that I actually added last year, which has been very, very productive for me, and I, and I think our head coaches is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, head coaches meeting that is in more of a casual setting. So either a breakfast or a lunch twice a year. So we have 11 head coaches. And so my secretary will line up uh, the head coaches. I want them uh, either right kind of prior to going into their season and then maybe coming out of their season where we have, and it's not an evaluation, it's really a casual uh, opportunity to really engage and get on uh, a more personal level with them. As you would imagine, with the footballs and the basketballs, there's probably a lot of interaction when you get into the tennis and golf. Sometimes they may feel like, hey, I'm not really getting the, the same access or the same uh, attention. And so this has really helped to, to really alleviate any, any thought of that. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of the year, every year, there's an evaluation one-on-one -on -one between me, the sports supervisor, and the coach. Mm -hmm. Derek, your, your process? Yes, and I, a lot of these processes are probably the same because mm -hmm. we've all been taught by the same people. And so uh, we do the same thing. We have the monthly head coaches meetings and it's the, with the senior staff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the individual meetings too. And so I have a standing meeting every week with the football and the head men's basketball coach. Now, we may not meet every week, it's, as you know, yeah. but Every week it's the same for the football coaches on Mondays and usually, especially during the season, we, we like to debrief on a Monday after a football game. Mm -hmm. I don't like to talk to coaches right after games uh, for whether we win or lose. So yeah. take a step back. We'll talk about it uh, in a couple of days. And then for basketball, his meeting is always on Thursday and they're always at the same time. So I'll get a call from one of their secretaries. If they need to meet, we'll meet. Or if I need to meet, we'll meet. Usually in those meetings, we don't have a lot of agenda items. We just right. like to talk, catch up about things. But obviously, if there's something important going on, that's the meeting we'll talk about it in. Now, we also have a need to meet basis. They can get me 24 seven. We're on speed sure. dial with all of our coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, but in particular, I oversee those two sports hands on uh, a lot more sometimes than some of the other sport programs. So they know that they can get me all the time. They also know my travel schedule. So they know I'm here. And, uh, but I'm always available to them in, in that way. So it appears uh, you're meeting with your direct report head coaches frequently, and it, it appears to me that the agenda is, is kind of free-flowing. It's not a we have to get through items one through ten. It's a what's, what's top of mind, what, what do we need to discuss, what are some national issues that are going on. Is, am, I, am I correct in that? You are, and, but sometimes it is a little bit more specific depending okay. on what time of year it is, too. Mm -hmm. I think coaches are a little bit more structured, especially during their seasons. So they come in because we're trying to win ball games, obviously. Yeah. So they will have an itemized list where they check things off. I think it's a little bit more free flowing during the off seasons and uh, a little less structured, a little more casual sometimes. So there, there may not be a list when we have those. Gotcha. So how do you reconcile a difference in direction in terms of a decision that was made that 
uh, it affects your head coach. And you, you guys have that relationship back and forth, and a decision that you make comes down, and you've got to try to reconcile that and make sure that the relationship continues to go in the right direction. Yeah, I think <clears throat> that happens. It's going to happen. I mean, because uh, obviously the, the, the head coach has uh, got an agenda that is specifically for their sport. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, you know, uh, that does not, you know, uh, dovetail into maybe what the athletic department or the university is direction is, whatever the issue could be. And so I think that's where building that relationship is important because if you're constantly the person that says, we can't do that or you're not going to do that, um, then there's really no relationship. So that's why I think it's really important that, to not only have the frequency of meeting, but also to develop some rapport to where there's trust. Um, when you have to tell someone no, but they do know that you care and there's an understanding, and that doesn't mean that they go, oh, yeah, I'm completely for that, but that there's a respect there that, okay, well, we're going to move on. And sometimes, obviously, as the old saying, we, it, sometimes maybe it's not no, maybe it's not now, maybe it's a portion of whatever the ask is. Um, but, I mean, I, I expect my head coaches to challenge me and to push and continue to want for their program. The coaches that are always content with whatever they have, usually the coaches that are not performing at a high level. Um, and so you, you do want that, but then you want a healthy respect for the authority and the boundaries that you're providing. And so that's a balance for, I don't want you to ask uh, beyond what you can, but also want you to ask. And so, um, and I think part of that is just building rapport and a relationship with them to where they understand uh, maybe where, where the fences are and where the boundaries are and what you can and can't do. And, and I agree with all those things. And, and what he's saying is coaches are very myopic and they have blinders on, uh, literally almost sometimes. So I think our job is to help them understand the big picture because they're looking at the smaller picture, even if it's the football program, which obviously is very important and, and helps fund a lot of things that we have going on. But there's still a larger larger global picture that sometimes coaches just don't understand mm -hmm. and say it gets back to the relationship and the communication and telling them why we're making this decision and sometimes I think it's my compliance background I never want to give a coach a quick no even if it's no in your mind so you want to walk them through why it's no or not yet or wait mm -hmm. or let's pause on that and think about it and because you don't understand it's it's much bigger than this we're talking about a 30,000 foot view rather than what's going on in your own individual program. So communication, relationship, and then the whys to why we're doing things are, are very important. How uh, in the weeds do you like to get, and this could vary sport by sport, program by program, but how in the weeds do you guys get as far as you know, roster makeup, scholarship, distribution, those sort of things? Well, I think it depends. I don't like to get into the weeds of those things. Sometimes we have to get sure. into the weeds uh, because it's just a different environment these days. I've been doing this for 25 years, and I, I try to train the coaches and say, if, if you're making a decision that requires my approval and sign-off, my boss's approval and sign-off, his or her boss's approval and sign-off, it may not be such a good idea. Um, when you have, maybe if it's student athletes or somebody you're trying to hire with maybe something in their backgrounds that needs to be really researched and fleshed out, that's when we have to be very, very involved. Now, I don't like to get too involved with telling them who to hire. Mm -hmm. I think my job is to hire the head coach mm -hmm. and, and help manage that person. But I do take feedback. Sometimes the coaches, and smartly, they will come and say, well, I'm looking at this person I'm going to hire or this person we're going to add to our roster. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And so we have to get involved that way. But particularly, I like to stay a little bit on the higher level. But sometimes you have to do get down in the weeds. And yeah, would, would echo those same things. I mean, you're, you know, you're hiring the coach, put them in charge of, of their sport or their department, if you will. And, and there's an expectation that, hey, you, you've got to, not to say, um, you know, you're, you're going to be judged based on it. I mean, it's a, it's a judgment um, uh, situation where, hey, you win. Uh, we're going to reward you. If you don't, we're going to have conversations. And so you would never want them to say, well, hey, these seven players on my team, you told me I had to take them mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason. Right, right. Uh, or, you know, these two coaches, I, I didn't really want them, but you, they're, they're alums and you made me hire them. Um, and so, you, you know, you really want to be careful there with that. At the same time, um, again, I go back to our coaches. I mean, not, I, my expectation with the head coaches is, hey, if you're going to hire someone, 
um, then we, prior to the offer, I mean, we need to know about it and probably have met with them, particularly in the sports of, you know, football, men's, men's, women's basketball, and for us even Louisiana Tech baseball. But uh, we, we want to know and have that chance to vet them. Um, I, I've, you know, I, I think I've met every one of those assistant coaches in football and basketball. It's my time as an AD. Um, I don't know if I've ever said, hey, coach, I don't think you should hire that person. Um, but um, now, from a student athlete standpoint, on who we sign and, and uh, maybe a transfer, I've got a lot, a lot more involved in why are they transferring? You know, in this day and age, we want to make sure that there's not some type of legal issue or, mm -hmm. or surprise. So I have had to tell coaches, no, we cannot take that student athlete for various reasons. Mm -hmm. Let's I just kind of go push back a little bit on going into structure. So you've got a relationship with, with your head coaches and you're building that relationship constantly. You look at your organization and the senior administrators that serve as sport administrators for your program. How do you divvy out uh, sports in relation to sport administrators to kind of galvanize your team and make sure that it's the best possible structure for your organization? Yeah, I mean, um, so basically everyone within our department that reports directly to me, so it's about five uh, direct reports, that, that makes up our senior staff. And so then they lead their, their departments. Everyone on our senior staff um, has a, a sport, at least one, uh, several have two, um, sports that they oversee. And um, we, as I've been at Louisiana Tech five years, uh, this process has been in place four, and we're, ju we're reshuffling the deck a little bit. I think kind of like a development portfolio, after mm -hmm. a while your donors can, you can kind of get stagnant in your portfolio. Um, and, and sometimes you want to look at that and say, hey, can we shift this coach around to a different administrator? That's just my philosophy on it, to where they get a kind of a refresh on their administrator. So we're going through that process right now this summer. Um, but um, I think part of that's personality, part of it's responsibility to be, be able to handle the responsibility, um, how demanding or how needy is this coach, and so ma matching them with someone that can, uh, that can be married to them in terms mm -hmm. of personality and, and, uh, and expectation. So it's, it's not just something that's put in a hat and we pick out and we divvy out. There's a lot of thought that goes through that on personalities and, and managing that coach and, and how they – um, how they might respond to a certain administrator. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll echo that, and, and some of the, the structures are the same. I have about six direct reports, and to uh, further emphasize changing the responsibilities sometimes, that's good. It helps the coach refresh, but it also helps the senior administrator and maybe give them a little bit more um, experience in some areas they haven't handled. Uh, great example, when I worked for Frank Burroughs at Arkansas, I realized that I really needed to get, I was over all of the spring sports, so I had oversight of all the spring sports, the men's programs. Mm -hmm. But I realized that if I was going to become an athletic director, I had to help with football and basketball. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of part of it, I think, in, in today's world. And so we had a great discussion about that. And, and obviously, and so I have the same model. So although I do oversee those sports programs directly and women's basketball, I have someone between me and them because um, I don't have the time, especially being a vice president of the institution, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to wade into the waters of the lights aren't working in the locker room or something like that. So I have someone that's, that's handling that day to, day to day who can come back and report out on what's going on with football all throughout the week. They may go to several meetings with football throughout the week and, and uh, interface with the director of football operations where I don't have that type of time to do that. But the football coach obviously can get me whenever he needs to. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's very important that you have someone that's there that right now can help manage the football or the basketball programs while I'm here. And kind of sticking with the sport oversight discussion, it's become very clear to me in my career even that sport oversight and the relationship that the coach and the sport administrator have is, is, is completely pivotal to really sustained success over time. What, is there an education process or advice that you commonly echo to your direct reports as far as, you know, what, what's my preferred relationship in, as the director of athletics with all of our sport administrators in relation to their coaches? How do you want them to interact? And, you know, what, what advice do you provide on the sport administrator side, especially for uh, folks that jump into the sport administrator role for the first time? Well, I, I try to lead by example. And, and sometimes it is trial by fire because you have to manage relationships and personalities. Mm -hmm. It's very key. It's just like we all, some of us have children. You can't always treat them all the same way. 
And so it, some coaches have a different management style. They want to talk to you every week. They want to call you up. They want to hang out on a social basis. Some coaches don't. So you try to kind of craft your own leadership style, sometimes around you know, what they have or what they want. But at the end of the day, you start with integrity. And, and with me, I try to make decisions that allow me, number one, to do the right thing and to sleep at night. And I think if you can stay within that framework and my senior administrators, they see that I operate like that, I ex expect them to operate the same way and the head coaches too. Yeah, I think and going back to the head coaches side of that, they've, you know, I'm, their expectation is to have respect for the person that we've assigned to them. But the sport administrator is, is, is really kind of an ambassador, particularly as you get back into the senior, uh, my, my senior staff room, they're the, kind of the ambassador to that coach, if you will, and hey, th these are the things that are going on. And they're, they're a communicator and they're a conduit. And part of that is converting conversation. So if, 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 if there's an ask, I'm like, well, we can't do that, you know, then, then the sport administrator can't go back and say, you can't do that. You know, they, they've got to be able to convert maybe my shortness and say, mm -hmm. hey, well, we can't do that. You got to tell the coach no. And then they've got to strategize on how they're going to communicate that effectively and, and, and um, to where they have rapport. But, uh, you know, the biggest thing that I tell, uh, and whether that's coaches or administrators, most of the time this conversation is for administrators as they're relating to coaches. You know, a lot of times uh, the game changes quick. All of a sudden a policy changes or a rule changes or, um, you know, it's a budget situation or whatever. And bad news has occurred, and now we've got to communicate it. And the thing that I tell our seniors team all the time is that bad news does not get better with time. And so, the, you know, you're, you're, you're delaying that opportunity to speak to that coach because you're worried about how they might respond to that news is, is not uh, beneficial or advantageous to that coach. Coaches, although they don't want to hear it, you got to think, they deal with bad news instantaneously all the time. So you're a football coach, it's first and 10. They just got the ball and all of a sudden there's a fumble. That's bad news. They immediately have to change their plan, put the defense back out there and make adjustments. Uh, an interception happens, quick change. So, or an injury happens. They didn't want to hear it, they don't like it, but they have to make adjustments. So coaches are used to making adjustments rapidly, but the sooner they can hear and, and be notified of the change that needs to occur, they may not like it, but they're used to doing that. So we've got to communicate with them quickly, very directly if there's some type of bad news in order for them to make an adjustment. That's right, and, what, and the key word is transparency. I, I think if you start with whatever the truth is. Mm -hmm. Be very transparent, be very detailed. Don't hold things back from them because the last thing you want is for them to get information from outside sources mm -hmm. um, before you can get it to them. So that's what he's talking about and be very transparent. I found that they can handle the bad news because we're all adults and we've been doing this a long time, um, but they can't handle being lied to obviously and neither can we. So it's just better just to put it out there, whatever it is, if it is bad news, let's get it out there, let's talk about it, let's talk about the process, and let's move forward. Don't try to hold things back from them. Let's switch gears again. That's excellent insight. Uh, you've got, uh, you and your head coach are planning to go out on a visit to a donor who's got a really a game-changing gift on the line. Uh, what's that the prep work look like? What's that conversation look like with your head coach uh, prior to that visit? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, I mean, I. I I'm very blessed. I think a lot of coaches have that opportunity. You get, I have, I, I've, I would say as I've been in AD 12 years, I've, I feel like I've done a better job here more, you know, in the last half of, my, of that time, the last six years, of putting coaches in front. One, one of the things I think early on is I was scared to put the coach in front of the donor for some reason that maybe they wouldn't be buying the vision. And that, that was poor leadership on my part. Um, since being probably at Louisiana Tech and maybe the last couple of years at McNeese, um, I've done more of that, and the reason is this. Coaches are used to being in the living room making a pitch all the time. Mm -hmm. They are very comfortable, but it's, it's about the conversation. It goes back to the relationship. If you're building that relationship with them in these meetings and these other settings, you know, say, hey, we need this gift for X. And it may even not be directly for their program, but you've had that relationship, and they go, you, that's, what you, what, that's what we need, boss. We're going to do it. Their ability to turn it up in a room um, all your head coaches, whether they're the golf coach or the football coach, uh, they're so used and so comfortable doing that in that setting where they can share the reasons why. Why do we do this? And at the end of the day, the donor, they love hearing from that coach because that's really where their passion is too. And so uh, I'm very blessed at Louisiana Tech to have some tremendous coaches that can do that. And 
And we just did our press box project for our football program, and we brought Coach Holtz with us uh, to see probably you know 10 donors uh, around the country and, and put them in front of him, and he was uh, very impactful in sharing the reasons why. And uh, and that's a facility he's not even going to live in. You know, it's a it's a revenue source for us. Uh, it, you know, his some of his staff will be there calling the game, but outside of that, you know, it did benefit his program, but. It's not like it was a weight room or a locker room project. It really hit his student athletes. But uh, that's something that I've, I feel like I've done a better job with of, of putting our coaches because, man, they are good in the room uh, and they're used to that. They're very comfortable. That's right. Now, and I'll add that the AD, don't be intimidated by the big personality, in particular with the coach, because that is what really stimulates your donor base, your fans. They, they are the faces of the program. And, uh, everybody knows that we we are we manage the program, but you have to put them in front of people, um, and because if you don't have them there too, I've noticed this: you have to have another meeting, and you have to bring the coach in. So because they want to know, well, is this what coach really wants, or is this just what the administration wants? They want to hear from that coach, especially if it's a multi-million-dollar project, which a lot of them are. They want to know if the coach is really on board with it. So it's just great. Don't be intimidated by having the big personality. Use that as much as you can. But when you walk in the room, make sure you're on the same page and you're not saying two different things because that can happen too. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your time. Really appreciate your insight. This is excellent. Great Absolutely. Job, thank you.